Welcome to the Chillac Potter's So Sunday morning service. God is good all the time. Put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, His light will shine. God is good. God is good.
forgiven Because you were forsaken And I'm accepted You were condemned And I'm alive and well Your spirit lives within me Because you died and rose again Amazing love
worship His holy name. Chilliwack Potter's House. Uh, we have a few prayer requests here. We have Mark uh, for sickness. We have Neil for sickness uh, victory over attacks. We have Bobby and Carrie prayer. Uh, Isaac. We have uh, little Jake, uh, Pastor Jay and Jen's grandson uh, for sickness. Pray for healing. Uh, we have Ashton Anderson recovery from a uh, from a coma, total recovery. We have Brendan uh, helping with his health. Uh, Josh Halverson will pray for a sickness and salvation. Uh, and Operation Christmas shoeboxes, Phil. We have to bring those back. Uh, Joe and Judy will keep praying for Joe and Judy. And Chad Coleman for health, for cancer. And I think we're back at the beginning. So how many people here have had a healing from sickness at some point in their life? I know I have. That's a lot of people. So that's why we keep praying for these. And we'll just bring these before God. And um, I guess I'll seal these prayers. Oh, no, Elliot will. That's how it works. All right, let's just give God praise as Elliot comes here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lord, that we can come here and worship your name this morning, God. We thank you so much for your miraculous power, God, the testimonies of those who've been, who've been healed and those that are yet to be healed. We, God, we pray for your divine appointments to uh, fall upon us, God, that we would see people touched, we'd see people saved, and we would indeed see people healed, God. We pray for peace around the world. We pray for peace for Israel in this time and for uh, the situation in Ukraine, Lord, that we would just see your hand move, God. We'd see lives changed. And we'd see people saved, God. We pray that we would just take your word to heart this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to see you this morning. Good to be in church. Here's your announcements. Tonight, 5.30 is prayer. And uh, our service is at 6.30. And this evening, there will be three preachers, Matt, uh, Rod, and myself. So come out and hear the gospel tonight. Okay, on Wednesday is our midweek service with 5.30 prayer. 6.30 is our service. And, of course, morning prayer, 7 to 8, every weekday morning here at the church. And Friday night, 6 o'clock, will be our Five Corners Outreach with Signs and Wonders. And uh, Saturday will be our Vancouver Outreach at noon, 12 o'clock, at uh, Granville in Georgia, the, the, probably the main intersection in Vancouver, and lots of foot traffic, and it's always uh, just a Holy Ghost time. So please, if you can set the time aside, come and support that, that'd be awesome. Amen. Let's give God praise as our ushers come up this morning. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for our salvation. 
Uh, in, the, in the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 35, Paul the Apostle is reminding us, and this is what he says, you should remember the words of the Lord Jesus, it's more blessed to give than to receive. You know, that's not just a, you know, a cliche out there, like everybody has heard that before. It's actually scriptural, and Jesus Christ said it himself. So every time the offering's taken up, if you could just let that, you know, that scripture, that, that word of God pass through your head, and it'll just bring some balance to your finances. Amen. Gord Bradley, if you could seal these prayers. God is good all the time. Put a song of praise in his heart and mind. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, his light will shine. God is good. God is good all the time. If you walk in through the valley, there are shadows on. He will guide you, He will keep you safe and sound. His promise to never leave you, nor forsake you. And it's good and true, God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in His heart and mind. God is good all the time, through the darkest night. Praise God. Well, it's great to be here in Vegas, and uh, I came once before and spent a couple of days here just to visit, but great to be here in the church, and uh, wow, it's hot here. <laughs> I was at the concert last night, and I thought, my goodness, very, very hot at that time of night, and so, uh, but great to see some people saved. Uh, I was in the foyer this morning and met an Aussie uh, that was there and uh, recognized his accent. He recognized mine. But uh, great to be here and, and appreciate Pastor's invitation. As he said, we have known each other for many, many years, uh, and we have had the privilege of you allowing him to come and minister uh, in Australia in many settings in our conferences uh, over the years. Um, I was reminded uh, recently the, he came and flew into Sydney and arrived on the morning that he preached, uh, was preaching at 11 o'clock, uh, got off the plane, got in the car, uh, uh, drove to the venue and got up and preached uh, at the 11 o'clock seminar, still wearing his sunglasses. <laughs> and uh, it was about 10 minutes into the sermon when he realized, hang on a minute, it's a bit dark in here. Uh, and he had his sunglasses on and took them off uh, and was blaming jet lag, but uh, amen. Appreciate you releasing him and allowing him to become a minister in Australia. If you have a Bible this morning, the book of Judges, chapter 6, the book of Judges, the sixth chapter, and I want to start reading in verse uh, number 2. I have no doubt that you've all heard of the man Elon Musk, and uh, he's a uh, very wealthy man. I think his wealth ranges between... Uh, a quarter and one-third of a trillion dollars. Uh, he has a son. His son's name is Xavier. But Xavier, his son, has petitioned the Californian court to recognize uh, his new female name, Vivian. And uh, Xavier says he no longer wishes to be related to his famous uh, and fabulously wealthy father in any way, shape, or form. Here's a guy that has access, no doubt, to opportunity, uh, to resources, to influence, uh, but has chosen a level much below that. 
another guy called Doug Batchelor. He's the teenage son of two multimillionaires. Likewise, he had everything growing up that money could buy. But as a teenager, he chose a lifestyle of drugs, violence, and suicidal thoughts, and by his own choices, chose to live in a cave near Palm Springs, scavenging for food in garbage bins. But it's not just the weird this morning. The reality is of many people's situations, and dare I say, uh, uh, many of God's people, Christians, born-again Christians, situations, the reality is many of God's people are living with far less than God had planned for them to live with. And I want to say this morning, it doesn't have to be that way. And God doesn't want it to be that way. In our text, we're going to read about Gideon. Gideon and God's people are under assault from the Midianites, And it's been that way for many, many years, and the Bible makes it very, very clear, and the point I want to make this morning, uh, they're living at a much lower level than they need to be, uh, and God wants to let them know, and God wants to let you know this morning, it doesn't have to be uh, this way. Judges chapter 6, I want to read verses 2 through 4, and then we want to skip down and read verse 11 through 16. I want to preach a sermon called, It Doesn't Have to Be This Way, uh, The Bible says, And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds, which are in the mountains. And so it was, whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up. Also Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza And leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey. Skip down to verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which is an Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezerite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, O my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Amen. Let's look first of all this morning and consider consider for a few moments living with less. Obviously, our text is a very brief snapshot of a season of life with God's people. And they are living with far less than they need to be. They're living in a time of hopeless defeat. And one of the signs of them living in hopeless defeat is the enemy of their souls is determining the outcome of their life and not God and God's Word. And one of the hallmarks of enemy assault is repeated patterns of defeat In their lives, the Bible says they're plowing the fields every year. They're planting seeds of hope and destiny every year. There's a promised harvest every single year. And yet year after year, the enemy comes in and destroys the produce. And verse 4 says, leaving no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. And a good question to ask yourself this morning is, can you identify? Are there repeated patterns or cycles of defeat in your life where the enemy and not God are determining the outcomes of your life? Are there repeated patterns of defeat in your life? Your Sunday school was on finances this morning. And, uh, but there's uh, times in Christians' lives where there seems like no matter how often they seem to get ahead, something happens and they fall behind again. 
The very time they first get out of debt, something happens uh, and they find themselves in, in debt uh, again. It's a cycle uh, of defeat. There is sickness in families. There are families where it seems like you just get over one thing and you're heading into another sickness. There are families that your kids are sick every Sunday morning and every Wednesday night and you haven't put an identifying mark on that. That's a repeated pattern of defeat and it doesn't have to be that way. But it's not just finances and it's not just your family. Many times it's also fruitfulness. Is it you pray? We had a great report this morning of people saved on outreach on the streets in the concert last night, yet sometimes people get saved and within a very short period of time, the devil has stolen the fruit away, just like in our text. The new convert that you're praying for to lock into the church, he gets a job and the job is in another city. Unattractive men get solicited by very attractive unsaved women. That's got to be the devil. <laughs> Brother, you're just not that good looking. But not just once, over and over again, ugly new converts get ripped off by attractive, unsaved people. Old boyfriends and old girlfriends come back on the scene. In Australia, we get a lot of people from various nationalities that get saved. And it seems like not a single one of those gets saved without somebody from their national church trying to reach out to them and rip them off and put them back into a cultural church and not a Christian church. And it happens on a regular basis. The family flips out to false doctrine, etc. When you live with repeated cycles or repeated patterns of defeat, uh, several things begin to happen. And you may identify with these this morning. Uh, number one uh, is we begin to accept that situation uh, as simply being normal operating procedure. Verse 11 says, Gideon is threshing out wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the way the Bible writes that, it's written like this is his regular pattern of life. He's just accepted that the enemy are going to rip him off and he patterns his life like the enemy is going to win. He takes his few little handfuls of grain and rather than threshing them out in the open where the wind can carry the chaff away, he simply takes his few handfuls of grain and he hides away in a wine press. It's normal life for him to live with far less than God says he can have. And there are people here, you've accepted the unacceptable. You're living at a level that God does not want you to live at, and yet for you it's just simply normal to live below where God wants you to be. You're meant to rule the land. They're meant to reap every single thing that they've sown in multiplications, uh, leaving over blessing, yet their defeat has become normal to them. The second thing that happens is we assess ourselves incorrectly is rather than identifying the enemy as the source, uh, here the Bible says Gideon looks at himself uh, and says, how can I save Israel? I'm a weak man. I come from a weak clan. I'm the weakest man in the weakest clan. Uh, rather than assessing where the problem really lies, uh, we begin to assess ourselves. We must be the problem. We're living this way because there's something wrong with me. No longer an assault of the enemy, but an assessment of me. I must be a terrible Christian. I ran an amber light. Actually, it was red, but I ran it anyway. We argue loudly as a couple. I raise my voice at my kids. We begin to assess ourselves and say, well, I'm living with less, but I know what the problem is. The problem's me. I must be doing something wrong. Otherwise, my situation would change. It's a repeated pattern of defeat. Numbers 13, 33, the children of Israel again said, we saw the giants. 
And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, so we were in their sight. Here they were going into the promised land. God simply says, go in and make a plan of how you're going to take the promised land. But the Bible says they assess themselves and says, we can't do this because we see ourselves as grasshoppers facing these giants. And the last thing that happens is we begin to accuse God. In verse 13, if the Lord is with us, why is this happening? And where are all the miracles? Now Gideon is accusing God of somehow God is not doing what God says he's supposed to do. There's a robbery. He's accepted that as normal. He wrongly thinks it's him And when God actually shows up, Gideon gets mad at God. And I pastor a church, and uh, I'd have to tell you that from time to time, there are people in my church, that's exactly the way they operate. Very, very specifically, where is God? What's God done? How come this is the way? And when God shows up for them, they begin to accuse God of not doing enough for their life. We assume that because God is apparently not helping us, uh, he must want us to stay this way, poor, uh, sick, and failing. There's a second thought this morning. That's some lessons to learn. I was here uh, uh, a while back, and I saw an advertisement on one of your television stations. Uh, It was a Capital One commercial. I guess they're a banking system or a finance company, Capital One commercial. And uh, in the ad that I saw on the TV, little kids, I'm going to say they were probably five or six or seven years of age, just little kids, and they're picking a basketball team. And they're the two captains there, and they kind of looking at the other little kids, five, six, and seven, they're choosing to play on their basketball team. And then as the camera begins to scan across the the potential players, uh, all of a sudden it pans back. And there's Charles Barclay as one of the possibilities to choose for your team. Now, for those that don't have a long memory, Charles Barclay was a former champion. He stands at about six foot six and 250 pounds, and he's available for one of these small kids' teams. And you can imagine the difference when an adult superstar joins the team of a small children's basketball team. That's going to make a big difference, can you say amen? When Charles Barclay takes the field in that situation, it's going to make a whole difference to the way that basketball team performs and their success on the field. It's like when God takes the field in your life. It's exactly the same when we invite God onto our side and invite God into our situation when God takes the field. Every single thing in your life changes. Can I ask you a question this morning? How do you think God feels when his people are living with less? I'll tell you how he feels. He takes the field. In verse 11 of our text, the Bible says the angel of the Lord comes into Gideon's situation and sits under a terebinth tree. Why does he do that? Because God says, I don't want to see my people living with less than I have said they can live with. I don't want to see them living that way and accepting those things as normal. And therefore, God takes the field. God doesn't want us to go on living this way. God wants us to have the victory more than we want the victory. God wants us to be healed more than we want to be healed. God wants converts to lock in more than we want converts to lock into our churches. God, therefore, he takes the field. In our text, it would be normal for God to take the field. We would pray. We would fast. We say, God, we need you to come and help our situation, but there's no sign that Gideon ever prayed. No sign that Gideon's fasting. There's no sign that Gideon's even contending for God to move. He simply accepted the situation as normal, and so God takes it upon himself and says, I am injecting myself. It's an intervention. 
I'm injecting myself into that situation because I don't want them to live that way. Can I say this morning that God cares about you? God may care about you more than you care about you. It's possible God cares about this church more than you care about this church. God cares about the city of Las Vegas. God cares about Nevada. God cares about the USA. God cares about all of these nations and more nations besides. And therefore, God is keen this morning to take the field. We don't have to force God to help us. We're simply expecting that God wants to help. We're simply praying and believing, God, God, you want to inject yourself. You want to involve yourself. You want to help us out in our situation because our text says he wants to and is very keen to take the field. 1 John 5 verse 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. That ought to be something that's on your favorite list on your phone. That God wants to answer my prayers. I'm not begging God. I'm not pleading with God. I'm saying, God, I'm expected that you want to take the field and help me in my situation. In our text, God's view of Gideon was totally different than Gideon's view of himself. Verse 12, God comes down to Gideon and calls him a mighty man of valor. I wonder if God thinks more of you than you think of yourself. Like I said, Gideon has assessed himself at this level and God says, no, I see much more for your life. I see destiny. I see dignity. I see influence. I see fruitfulness. I see possibilities. God calls him a mighty man of valor where in the natural, there's no, there's no evidence of that. He's taking his little briefcase of wheat off to the wine press every day. No sign of those things, but God says, you are, in my eyes, a mighty man of valor. He's on our side. We're not trying to get God to involve himself. He wants to involve himself. He already sees the victory. And we have more power, more dominion, more influence than we realize. Last month, a student from Moldova inherited nearly $1.6 billion from a long-lost relative. Sergei Sudev was left the fortune by an uncle that he had not seen for 10 years. Now, his pastor said in Sunday school, we're not praying for wealthy uncles to die and give us all the money. <laughs> but here's this guy. This wealth, is, it's, it's, it's there. And it was there for a long time. He's not... Knowing that, he doesn't recognize it, he doesn't appreciate that, but it's there all along. And I want to say to this morning that God is there all along with your life. And you have more power available to you, more power, more influence, more fruitfulness, more possibilities available to your life than many times we realize. Romans 8.37 says we are more than conquerors. One translation calls us super conquerors. And all of your situation can begin to change. And the starting point uh, is you start to believe that that is true. Everything that I've said this morning is true. And it can apply to your life. Uh, Matthew 9, 29 says, according to your faith, be it unto you. Whenever anybody, somebody, you this morning, choose to believe that God says, you can have what he says you can have. He takes the field uh, Things begin to change from that point forward, and there's no telling what God can do. Amen. I close one final thought, then we'll pray. And that's learning to lead. Two other guys, a guy called Zolt and his brother Giza Paladi, were living in a cave outside Budapest. They eked out an existence selling junk they scavenged on the streets. They've just inherited seven billion dollars. That's billion with a b billion dollars. After their grandmother died, the two unmarried men. How many unmarried men you got in the building? Any unmarried men? All right. 
the two unmarried men said that until now no woman would look at them living in a cave but they looked looking forward to a much brighter future I bet they are <laughs> nothing like seven billion dollars to make you more powerfully attractive to the single girls <laughs> three things that Gideon does to activate a supernatural dimension you're going to leave you with these this morning then we're going to pray and I want to challenge you that all that I've said is true for your life and I didn't cover all the various possibilities of where you may find yourself this morning, but God's Word is true. He wants to take the field in your life. There's three things I want to give you that you can do to activate God's, this dimension in your life. Number one is the Bible says that Gideon prepares an offering of a young goat and unleavened bread. In Judges 6.21, we didn't read it, but the Bible says these words then the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and he touched the meat and the unleavened bread and fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. The question is this morning, what can you bring to God as a token that from this point forward things are going to be different? What can you bring to God? What would signify today that from this day forward, this is going to be a reality in your life? What offering can you bring this morning? Well, I'm not taking a financial offering. That's, a, that's probably good news for you. Maybe you could pray some extra. Just simply going on record with God that I, I, I believe this to be true and I'm going to give you a token of my investment in this. You could pray some extra. Maybe you could witness some more. Maybe you could read further into your Bible reading every single morning. Maybe you could love deeper. I could go on and on and on. Huh? What you're simply saying is I refuse to go on living in a cave. I refuse to go on living with less. God, I want you to take the field and as a token that I want things to change in my life, I'm changing something in my life. Something that you know God is urging you to do, you could start doing that from today forward. And at this altar, you could go on record with God that from this day forward, this is going to be my offering as a token that I want you to take the field, Gideon prepared an offering. And when Gideon prepared the offering, the Bible says that fire came out of the rock and consumed the sacrifice. Anytime you see fire in the Bible, especially when it has no natural starting point, they're not out there rubbing sticks together or lighting a match. Anytime you see fire in the Bible, you're recognizing the presence of the Holy Ghost. That's God getting involved. That's God reaching out of heaven. Rocks don't typically catch on fire. Can you say amen? Maybe in Nevada, different places. <laughs> but typically, that's not what we're expecting. And so here's Gideon. He makes an offering. He makes a token offering sacrifice to God and God says I like what you've done and all of a sudden fire comes out of the rock and I'm believing God in your life today as you make your offering to God whatever it might be that the supernatural is going to attend that sacrifice God will manifest himself and things will change when we see fire miraculous conversions Pastor praying this morning for miraculous finances to pay off a building that we can plant more churches. God's into that. Can you say amen? Supernatural stuff happens when you prepare an offering before the Lord. The second thing that happened is the Bible says that Gideon pulled down the altars of Baal. Verse 28, he chopped down the altars of Baal. This is very much human nature. And again, you may find yourself here this morning. When we don't think that God is giving us what we think we deserve, God goes from being center place to just simply off center. We don't, we're in church this morning. We're believing God. You're here in the house of God. 
but he's just not center in your life anymore. Something else begins to take priority in your life. And God is there. He's available. We can, you know, we're there. We're calling ourselves Christians. Uh, but something else has taken center place. Uh, and in Gideon's situation, God's people's situation, it was Baal. It was the worshiper of the people around them. What the people around them thought as important and critical, money and power and sex, whatever it might be, it's taken center stage in their life and God's off to the side. So Gideon prepares an offering, number one, but number two, he pulled down the altars of Baal. He put God back where God deserves to be, center place. And again, this morning, you want God to take the field and change things in your life. You have to put God back in center place. He's got to once again be the number one priority in your life. And then God, just like he did for Gideon, will begin to move on your behalf by chopping down the altars of Baal. Gideon's saying that God will rule here and not Baal. I'm a man of God. I'm a woman of God. I'm not a woman of the world. A man of the world. I'm a man of God. Uh, and the third thing the Bible says about Gideon, which I think is very, very important to put in there, is he proceeds to attack the Midianites under the cover of darkness. He doesn't become a superhero. He's sneaking out in the bushes at nighttime. So, I, God, I'm taking it all on board, but I'm just, you know, I'm doing this at night time. Can I encourage you this morning that not all Bible men and Bible women are superheroes. They simply get about the business at the level they can get about the business. And God says, I like what they're doing. I'm going to take the field. Because sometimes we do think ourselves like Gideon. I'm the weakest man in the weakest clan. I'm the weakest man in the clan. Guys, I, un- I know exactly who you are. But if you're simply to do what I'm saying for you to do at your level, you can go with, from living with less to living with more. I mentioned at the start, I closed with this, Doug Batchelor. He was the teenage son of two multimillionaires and uh, chose to turn his back on that, began to uh, rebel and go his own way and to live in uh, drugs and violence and crime, various things, living in a cave, an actual cave in a hillside above Palm Springs, scavenging for food in garbage bins. He tells the story that uh, he came back to his cave one day and uh, somebody had placed a Bible on his bed. To this day, he doesn't know where it came from. And literally, if you look it up, he's in a cave up on the hills there. And somebody's placed a Bible on his bed. And he had been hitchhiking and somebody that picked him up had witnessed to him. So he kind of had a gospel message, but he's living in a cave. He begins to get the Bible and he begins to spend some time reading the Bible. And I'm going to paraphrase. Obviously, I don't think he said these words specifically, but he got it in his head that he's living with far less than what God says he can have. You don't have to live in a cave, scavenging food out of garbage bins. Life doesn't have to be this way. And so Doug Batchelor, he said he got saved. He walked out of the cave. He walked into town. He locked himself into a local church. He became a disciple. God restored his life. He got married He became a pastor, and today he's a preacher. And apparently he has a TV ministry on about 125 stations in America. Here's a guy literally living in a cave that simply says, I don't have to live this way. God has more for my life. Uh, God saved him, dedicated himself to the things of God, uh, and now God's using his life, and God can do exactly the same for you this morning uh, it doesn't have to be this way. Let's bow our heads. We're going to close on a word of prayer. Heads about eyes are closed. Thank God for these testimonies of people being saved on outreaches in Chandler and on the streets here in Las Vegas, the concert last night. 
And maybe you're here this morning and you need to be saved. You're not born again. You don't know Jesus. There you go. Encouraging message. That, uh, that pastor's name is Rob Walsh. Just to put that in the file in the back of your brain. We have to pray for him. Amen. Thank God that he wants to help us. Amen. And it's just uh, praise God for that. Amen. Let's bow our heads this morning. Perhaps this morning you don't know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. You don't have that joy of having your sins forgiven. And you'd like to come to Christ, you'd like to repent and trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. We just uh, would be honored to give you an opportunity to respond to the love of God this morning with an upraised hand. If you want to give your life to Christ all over this place, or perhaps you've been Christian in the past and you're not living for God now and you want to come back to Jesus, if that's you, amen. You can look up. We all love God this morning. Let's stand, let's worship God. Before we close... Uh, remember pastor will be back Tuesday I think for Wednesday night service he's preaching in Holland so just uh, remember him in your prayers that God would just anoint his ministry and God would move over there and please come back tonight 530 prayer 630 service and hear uh, the three guys preach the gospel amen and uh, we'll have a good time I'll get Derek Coleman to close in prayer <laughs>